Arizona. He is interested in viruses, all things viruses. Um, and today he's going to talk to us about viruses in Antarctica. Thank you. Um, so what I'll do first of all is, before we get to the frozen co uh, continent, I'll kind of take, in, take you guys through a little bit of a ride through the world of viruses and eventually kind of land up at the continent because I'd like to give you a perspective of where we are, what we know, and how little we know. So if you think about viruses, we do know a lot about viruses, but we know very little about the viruses that we know about in the sense that Historically, people have been depicting diseases caused by viruses well before we even imagined viruses existed, or people have identified them. 1700 BC, classical uh, hieroglyph uh, hieroglyphics here, where you can see poliomyelitis symptoms. But viruses have inspired people. They've inspired poets. Here's a poetry written in Japan, um, looking at about 1,000 years ago. And it's basically a virus, a Gemini virus, that causes these vein clearing symptoms, this yellowing of the veins. And actually, people have written poetry about it. So it's really fascinating how viruses have always been with us in our history. And we've done things with it. We've painted pictures where there are viral-like symptoms, tulips with breaking patterns. And this is caused by a plant virus called a potivirus that causes that. And if you go back into your gardens, a lot of you will have dahlias growing in the backyard. If you see breaking patterns like this in your dahlia, inevitably it's due to a viral infection. But what also happened around a period, this is around 15, 1600, the Dutch became very rich from a viral infection. These tulips were selling for about 10,000 guilders at one point. And today's value, a tulip was be making at that point, 1,200 US dollars. So on average, a good salesman was selling $60,000 worth of tulips in Holland at the peak due to a viral infection. And we move on from there and then indirectly, we've got variola virus that moved out of Africa into Europe. We're looking at around 17 AD, uh, 700 AD. But then with colonization, without Cortes even knowing this, he had a biological weapon that he came with and actually, we actually colonized the Americas indirectly without knowing that we were using a pathogen, a viral pathogen in doing so. So viruses have actually played along with us. They've been in our lives. They've actually been there. And if you think about viruses, there are entities that infect an organism. So wherever there is an organism, inevitably, there will be a virus. Simple as that. People have tried to estimate the biomass of these viruses, like bacterial viruses. We're looking at bacteriophages, almost greater than 10, 100,000 elephants put together. That's the biomass we're looking at. Look at whales. The amount of Calici virus particles they're excreting on a daily basis is pretty staggering. That's a large amount of viral particles they're actually throwing out or excreting on a daily basis. You look at bacteriophages in our water supply, pretty high numbers. But for me, looking at it from a medical perspective, this number is pretty staggering. The number of HIV genomes that are existing on the planet today. What is even more scary for me as a scientist and an evolutionary virologist is that it is highly likely that any individual that is on antiretroviral therapy at the moment, and that is a cocktail of drugs, which is a heart therapy, you will find at least 30% of the population that will be resistant to all the drugs on that panel. But the thing is, they will have some sort of mutations that will be actually impairing function here or there, but this is the possibility we're looking at. So inevitably, with HIV and things like that, we're looking at vaccines to try and cure that. Now, up until a couple of years ago, we've always looked at viruses from a pathogenic angle. Viruses cause disease, and they are the nasty buggers. However, this is a beautiful paper from Marilyn Rusnik's group about almost 10 years ago now, where she was looking at panic grass that is growing at Yellowstone National Park. And this grass is growing at 55 degrees centigrade. But there is something really unique about it. That grass is colonized by a fungus, and that fungus is infected by a virus. The virus induces a concept of hypovirulence in the fungus. It reduces the pathogenicity of the fungus. The fungus, as a result, doesn't completely outgrow and kill the grass. 
you remove the fungus, so by default you take the virus out, that grass dies straight away. So you're beginning to notice these really beautiful patterns of symbiosis in some cases where viruses are beneficial to the host and the environment that they exist in. The other thing that we do know about is parasitoids. These little wasps that lay their eggs in caterpillars, what they do at the same time is a lot of the larvae of caterpillars, I'm sorry, a lot of the caterpillars will produce an enzyme and that's a defense mechanism to a foreign object to encapsulate the eggs and then they get removed. However, the parasitoid is very, very clever. It injects a virus with it and that virus produces an enzyme that prevents the encapsulation by the host. So you've got this really, really interesting thing where the virus and the parasitoid act together to make sure there is proper growth of eggs that are delivered into that caterpillar. So we're beginning to see these really, really beautiful patterns. Now, this being a marine sec group here, everyone knows about the roles viruses play in ecosystems, especially in marine ecosystems. I don't want to even go there, but they actually are very, very significant in our ecosystems. We're changing the way we think about viruses. We've always thought of viruses as very small entities, but now we're beginning to find these large viruses, really large genomes, almost a thousand genes. What are viruses doing with such large genomes? We actually have no idea. Are these relics that are sitting between bacteria and viruses? And some people have started thinking about the entire concept of a fourth domain of life, that these megaviruses, which are mimiviruses, mammaviruses, etc., that are found predominantly infecting single-cell organisms like amoeba, mainly protists, they think that these might be these relics that might form the fourth domain of life. And the main crew that is driving it is Didier Raoult, who's based in France. My group is kind of a weird group. We work across ecosystems. We work from the tropics to polar regions. And so it's a bit of a shock to our systems because we go from pretty hot climates down to the other end very, very quickly. Because we're an evolutionary virology group, we're interested in how viruses evolve, mechanisms in, they use to evolve. We've made a certain number of points that we will check in. First of all, we want to study full genomes of viruses. And that is very important for us because genes within a genome evolve at different rates. There are non-coding regions which are also very important in our evolutionary calculations. So we would like to actually determine the full genomes, and as a result of that, we've chosen small DNA viruses to work with. RNA viruses, some of them are pretty large. It's really difficult to try and sequence the non-transcribed um, domains, which are on either side, so it gets a little bit complicated. We've been focusing a lot of our energy on these single-stranded DNA viruses, which Maya has here been focusing as well, and predominantly because of the size of the genomes the largest of these type of genomes goes to about eight kilobases, 8,000 nucleotides. So that is quite good for us. But these viruses are weird. Now, this is a virus that nobody would, some of you might have heard of. A lot of you would think it's a really, really stupid system. We all know about influenza virus, right? Eight segments capsidated into one virion, and that all gets packaged together and transmitted. Here, we've got a virus infects plants, six individual circular molecules. Each one encodes one gene, so one protein. Each one gets packaged into a different virion. All of them need to actually enter one cell to cause an infection. So think about the dynamics. There is another relative of it that requires eight molecules. So eight different virus-like particles need to come in to create an infection. So we've been studying this on land a little bit. They infect bananas, and that's kind of interesting because they cause these bunchy top kind of symptoms. We haven't found it in the Americas, but it's actually found in Hawaii and everywhere else in the world. These viruses, just like influenza viruses, evolve by reassortment. In influenza viruses, we know there are eight segments and there are two proteins that are actually on the outer surface. That is the neuraminidase and the hemagglutinin, and that's why we use the words N and H, and the one, two, three, four, five, all those numbers are different variants of those things. And in our reassortment, 
we are reassorting those RNA molecules. These guys are reassorting the segments during infection. They are also recombining. So during replication, they're swapping templates and exploring sequence space very, very rapidly. So we are interested in their evolution. What we do is we can actually do phylogeographical studies and date very, very particular events, such as we know that the diversity hotspot of bananas is Southeast Asia and around Papua New Guinea. It's not surprising that we see some sort of an origin in Southeast Asia of the virus and then get seeded into other points. And this is around 900. And we can start dating events, looking at quarantine systems in Australia. Even though Australia has a very, very tight quarantine system, you've got two different introductions of this virus into this country. So we can start tracking these kind of things. And that's why we're really interested in large genomes. We can actually do very, very good epidemiology studies as well. We also work with animal viruses. And here is a group of viruses called circoviruses. They infect pigs, parrots, pigeons, geese, etc. And these are really, really simple. They've got two open reading frames. They encode two genes, one to encapsulate itself, the other one to enable it to replicate. And this is kind of a really interesting area for us. because so I'd never thought about it until I started working with racing pigeons. When I talk to my friends about it, racing pigeons they get taken to a site of a race and could be a foreign country. They, go, they all get housed in one aviary, so you can think about disease transmission. They get released during the race. Only 50% of them come back. The rest find new mates and a new home and settle down. So you've got transmission of virus from one country to another. And we also work with this really, really weird thing that causes feather loss. And this is kind of how I ended up in the Antarctic. Parrots are, suffer a lot from this circovirus causes beak and feather disease. You can see the beak deformity in this cockatoo, sulfur-crested cockatoo. Here is a rainbow lorikeet in New Caledonia, which I went and had a look at. It's pretty much lost most of its feathers, can't fly, just falls off the nest straight onto the ground. It's really, really weird. We know it's probably originated in Australia, and the Australians being Australian, this cockatoo had lived a life of its own. I think it died at the age of 120, had been to many countries around the world, lived the last 10 years in a pub, and they gave it a beautiful obituary. All right? So that parrot had its own life. So we've been tracking some of the movements of these parrot viruses in the sense, what is happening? Because we know about the pet trade. In the pet trade, a lot of the animals get brought in. They're captured from outside. They're under stress. If you guys have parrots at home, if your parrot is stressed, it's going to be picking its feathers all the time. When animals are stressed, the immune systems are down. They're more susceptible to other diseases. You put them all in a cage, you pretty much got clear transmission. This is a study we did in Poland looking at breeding facilities, and they are full of these viruses. They're re recombining, evolving, and also, I can go to New Caledonia and I can look at a breeder and say, hey, can I have a sample of your birds that are infected? And he'll give them to me. I'll say, I can tell you that you bought a pair of breeding uh, eclectus parrots from Europe. And he's like, why? I say, well, it's very obvious. I look at the phylogenetic analysis. I can say it's exactly from there. That's where you brought. So we can do some really, really beautiful things. Once we have full genomes, we can look at introduction of some of these diseases into new environments, like, for example, we know that in New Zealand, we've got two different introductions of this virus that have come in. In New Caledonia, there have been multiple introductions and things like that. So moving away from that, we think about the concepts of virology. Things that I've described are just a snippet of things that we know a lot about. But in the greater scheme of things, they are very little. If I were to take the landscape of viruses that exist on this planet, put them on a grid, which is 10 by 10. All these little red lines pretty much are what we know within that whole landscape. So it might be a stone or a tree in that entire landscape. If I were to sum that up and put it together, it'll be less than 1% of everything that we know about viruses on the planet. We know very little about viruses. We don't even know what their sequence space is. So the other thing is, in most ecosystems at an ecology level, we've actually never looked at viruses. We've looked, started looking at microbes now because we have certain gene signatures we can use. But viruses we've rarely looked at. 
the ecologists in the marine system have been very good and meticulous about this. But the guys in terrestrial ecology, and I point to my, myself there, we've been really bad at this. To understand these concepts of spillover, especially with land use, change in environment with, say, fisheries, we've got animals coming into much closer contact. What is going on? We have no idea. Will we see spillover of pathogens? Will we see zoonotic events taking place? We have no idea unless we start populating this landscape. Now, with prokaryotes, there's been one very beautiful thing, is that we have a common gene that is required by all eukaryotes or prokaryotes for, for protein synthesis, and that's the ribosomal RNA gene. So we have one gene signature which we can use, and we can do beautiful profiling on any ecosystem we want. The problem with viruses is we do not have any of that. Viruses are either single-stranded or double-stranded. They can be RNA or DNA. They do not have a single gene that is common to all viruses. So we can't go into an ecosystem, set, put together a set of genes, and say, okay, this is all we're going to look at, and say, and we can compare and contrast. It doesn't work. Even within the group of viruses we've classified and we've kind of have understood little bits about, there is only a suite of genes that we know about, and even that is so little and so much variation that we're struggling. So we are so far behind the microbiomics projects that are in place, we are way behind that because we do not have a gene suite. And then all we can do is we can look at our public databases, which are so poorly populated that, for example, if I was holding a glass of wine and I had in my database a beer, that would be the closest match I would get to that wine, which actually is not really the same thing at all. The whole fermentation process is slightly different. The source of the sugar is different. And that's what we're looking at with viruses. And then people are making certain extrapolations from there. So they're saying that there is wine, but actually it's not even wine, it's beer, but we don't actually have that beer in our database. So where do we start? So we're in that kind of realm where we don't even know where to get to. And we can't use operational taxonomic units that the microbiologists are using with 16S or 18S RNA uh, identification. So what we've done is we've started a completely different system. We've decided we're going to work in all ecosystems and we're going to populate this database at a single-stranded DNA level and a double-stranded DNA level. We've decided to work with top-end predators. So how about we start getting this concept of concentrating the prey, uh, sorry, concentrating, yeah, organisms into a system. If you use the same concept of accumulation, in a top-end predator? Can we use similar things as a way of concentrating? Can we use bioaccumulators and concentrators in systems like mussels, bivalves, to concentrate water for us rather than us having to run it through a tangential filtration system? Obviously, browsers are great because they're eating things and then defecating it. And also, animals, we shed viruses on a daily basis through our fecal matter. So it's a non-invasive sampling technique. We can do large-scale sampling with very, very little uh, financial input or ethical input that we need to have in there. One thing that we found, this is a project based on a project I did with some civil engineers, was to look at movement of viruses around water. We found that viruses love sand, and they tend to stick on sand and silica environment. So we started sampling benthic sediments for that very reason, so we can actually find out what's happening in those things. So we're working pretty much across different systems to try and populate these things. And as we start looking at it, we start discovering totally new groups of viruses. And Maya and Karina have been involved in some of this. This is a big thing that we did in dragonflies. We've been finding them in pretty much serum samples of humans. We've been finding them in cerebrospinal fluids, things that we never knew about. So are some of these viruses we're finding interacting with our neurons? Are they making us rabid or change our behavior patterns? We have no idea. So can we start associating some of our behavior patterns that we actually have never associated with pathological states to some of these viral-like elements that might be rewiring them? We know rabies does it, rewires our brains, or the animals' brains, the uh, dogs, makes them salivate. Saliva comes out. That's where the virus particles are. They bite. They're aggressive. That's how the transmission chain takes place. So we're finding a lot of these viruses. We're finding some really bizarre viruses in the permafrost. So in the Arctic, 
Kerry, who used to be here, found this really, really bizarre virus here, completely new virus, related to things that have been found in sclerotinia, sclerotorium, which is a fungus down there. He was able to make an infectious clone out of this, and it replicated in plants. And he found this in caribou feces in the Arctic in an ice core that was 120 meters deep. So these viruses are trapped in our ice sheets with climate change. We're actually releasing them into the ecosystem. What impacts are they having in this ecosystem? We have no idea. And then when you start looking at different animals, you start discovering entire new groups of viruses. Here is a group that Eric, uh, sorry, Terry and I have been working on. We keep finding them in all sorts of primates, but we have no idea what they do. So if this is what we are finding in ecosystems that humans have actually so heavily influenced, what is happening in ecosystems that we have had very little impact on? And this is kind of where we're going. There are other bacteriophages that we find in all ecosystems. And what we notice is there is a lot of genome plasticity. Here are Gokusha viruses. These are bacteriophages. I've color coded all their open reading frames, so gene cassettes. And you start noticing certain trends, for example, there. Most viruses will keep their cassette as they are. These guys seem to be shuffling it around. So there is genome plasticity. And this is actually helping them evolve and bypass certain mechanisms of defense from their host. So these viruses are moving around. So we started thinking about larger concepts and thought, can we start pretending to be ecologists, even though we know nothing about ecology? So we decided to go to a lake in New Zealand. It's a high altitude lake and thought, let's do a test piece here. And maybe this might set the scene for what we want to do on the ice. We decided to actually sample some of the players in the lake system, benthic sediments, water, which is a common environment they all exist in. We took dragonfly, damselfly larvae, took gastropods. We took a variety of mussels, clams, other things that were there. And we wanted to see what viruses exist in them. And is there a network we can build to show the flow of viruses? And perhaps that will give us some sort of indication on who is interacting with who. We find lots and lots of diverse viruses never described before. Not surprising. Some viruses we find in certain entities, like the larvae, but not necessarily do we find them in the sediments. Others we find them ex all across. And we can start breaking.